The 24 Shades of Blue Cold Case Edition is about real, ongoing investigations. The following conversation may be disturbing to some people and is not recommended for all ages. Viewer discretion is advised. In the late hours of January 25th, 2004, Mason Sharifi and his friends headed to a bustling club in Midtown Toronto. What started as a night of revelry quickly turned to tragedy. As the group made their way out of the club, chaos erupted in the corridor. Gunshots rang out, leaving Mason crumpled on the ground. Panic set in as the crowd scattered in all directions. Little did Mason's friends know when they arrived at the club that they would be leaving without one of their own. This is 24 Shades of Blue Cold Case Edition. I'm Anna May, your new host for this series. I'd like to welcome back Acting Detective Sergeant Steve Smith to the show. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. So, I mean, this case, it's just so unfathomable. Uh, can you talk me and walk me through the events leading up to this murder? Yeah, I mean, Mr. Sharifi and his friends were obviously out for a night of partying in Toronto. They had been to a few clubs and such, and then they decided to go to um, after hours clubs after they were, the original clubs had closed. So, strangely enough, in on Geary Avenue, that this was a second floor um, area, and there was actually two after hours clubs working in the same area at the same time. Um, both were fairly full. There's probably over a hundred people in in both of these clubs. Um, these weren't well maintained clubs. These were more about making money for the the people that were running them, putting as many people through as they possibly could, collecting their money for the night. And once the the nightclubs were found out by the police, and it was over with. So they had a you know hundred, maybe just over a hundred people in both these clubs. About five a.m., they both emptied out for the night, and people started to leave. And obviously, a gunshot rang out in the hallway, and Mister Sharifi was shot right in the head and left to die in the hallway. Nobody actually ever called this in. So police and fire ended up showing up because um, later in the morning, someone actually pulled the fire alarm. They must have seen the body in the in the hallway and went out and pulled the fire alarm. And that's why first responders actually showed up. Oh, that's incredible. And it's it's so tragic. I, I, I want to take a step back, though. I want to know more about Mason's personalities and character. Let, let's talk about him. Yeah, I mean, he came to Canada as a young youngster from uh, Iran. And he was here living in Toronto. Um, at the time, he wasn't working, but he was looking for work and hanging out with his friends, um, spending social time out. And on, like we said, on the nights in question, they were out for a night of partying, ended up at this after hours club. Uh, the ironic part is outside of the building at Geary Avenue, after um, Mr. Sharifi had been shot, there was actually another gunfight between two different people where they were shooting at each other out on the street area. So those clubs that night, um, the after hours clubs were very dangerous. So we don't even know how many guns were in there at one time. There obviously was no security, no checking of people going in and out. And we know that there was at least three guns there. How many more were in there? Oh my gosh. I, we're going to talk more about, I think that incident, cause I'm, I'm really curious about that, but just getting back to Mason, uh, I, did he have any relationships with the police or prior history? I mean, he did not have, he'd had some minor interactions with police, but nothing of any consequence. It's not like he was a hardened criminal or anything. He was just a normal person going about his life and he was out for a night. And unfortunately, um, whatever happened that night, his friends that were with him, one, they had left him. So he was on his own. But I mean, that's not uh, totally unusual at club areas, but the fact that he was shot, um, straight in the head in the middle of a hallway and everybody just walked over him to get out of the area. And that says a lot about the clientele that was there that night. Yeah. I mean, we speak a lot about these after hour clubs uh, and there's a lot of drug, uh, I guess it's, it's a, it's a place to, to do drugs. Do you think that this was a drug related incident on his part? People that talk about him say that, he, you know, he, he was just a nice kid. Like he was just a, a nice guy going about his business he probably had some minor interaction with somebody in the club and this person for whatever reason thought that he would pull out a gun and actually shoot him just to to prove a point i mean there's there's no real reason for this and when you're at a club with somebody i mean what's going to happen there that is going to 
lead you to the point where you're actually going to shoot somebody in the head over something minuscule that had happened that night. But unfortunately, as you said, once you, you include drugs and alcohol and bravado and this, sometimes this is what happens in these, these sort of places when there's, when there's no security there to, to protect anybody. And you mentioned just down the street, there was another incident with, with gun violence. I mean, do you think that's related? Do you think that he was in the crossfire and he was just an innocent victim or did he have any history of, of gang related uh, relationships? No, I mean, I think he was an innocent victim and I believe that this probably happened um, in the hallway beforehand and whatever precipitated outside, whether it was the same people that were involved or a different set of people. But obviously there was another confrontation outside that resulted in two groups firing shots at each other. So as we said, that area, Geary, was a very dangerous area that night. I mean, there was a number of guns in there and, and uh, we see the results of what happened. So you mentioned that there were a lot of people at the club and no one called for 911. But at the same time, I read somewhere that there was a, some sign of struggle with him. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, I mean, he could have been involved in a fight or it could have been as easy as when he was shot, people just stepped over him and stepped on him as they went out. So it could have appeared to be a struggle. So we aren't really sure whether there was an actual fisticuff, an actual fight. Or, I mean, if you had a gun pulled on you, you may be trying to fight for your life as well. But uh, obviously there were some signs that uh, that his body was a bit battered at the time. And so those were just some, some injuries that he did get. Yes. And was anything missing on his body? Yeah, it looks like they had probably rifled his, uh, his body to take whatever was on him as well. Now, we don't know whether that was the actual shooter or that was other people that had saw that he was dead in the hallway and decided he didn't need what was on him. I mean, you just never know in these things uh, what exactly transpires. That's unbelievable. I don't know who would go and rob someone that who was shot and they they saw him on the street and just to rob him. Ah. Yeah, it's unfathomable that people would A, walk over a dead body and not call the police and B, that people may rifle a person's body and take his uh, his possessions because they figure he doesn't need them if he's been shot dead. Mm -hmm. But they, they aren't bothering to call for help. I mean, not saying that he would have been able to survive if they had, but I mean whenever these things happen, the quicker you get medical treatment, the the more likely you are to survive. And what evidence have we been able to gather so far? Um, in reality, the only evidence we have are the shell casings. And again, you know, we're going to utilize science um, now and in the future to hopefully be able to create some forensic evidence off those shell casings. Mm -hmm. And so I know you mentioned again about the shooting that happened afterwards, and there was a woman present during that second shooting. Um, can we talk a little bit about that situation and about that person. Yeah, I mean, whenever there's a firefight out on a street, it becomes a huge event, right? There's people out on the streets anywhere in Toronto at all times of the day and night. Um, and there was a young lady there as well. And I mean, certain people were willing to give us some information as to what occurred. But again, we don't really have a nexus between the shooting on the street and the shooting that happened upstairs. Could it be the same people? Possibly but we don't have physical evidence to say that it was at this time. Mm -hmm. This is, it's unbelievable. You think that the the streets of Toronto are safe, but yet things like this could just easily happen out in the open and you just never know and just might be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, I mean, most of the time, Toronto is a safe city. Uh, you compare it to other big cities and Toronto is relatively safe. Um, the unfortunate part is there's a small um a small, very small amount of people in this city that don't want to follow the rules. And as you said, uh, the thing you don't want is is people that are there and innocent bystanders and someone being shot in some sort of beef that was going on between two groups. Um, but you just never know, right? You never know where you are and what could happen. And we've seen it all over, not only our city, but all the cities in North America. Um, violence can erupt at the, at the drop of a hat over virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think it's the responsibility of the public and all of us in the community to, to keep Toronto safe. So do you have any last words or messages to, to our listeners? 
Uh, just the fact that if anybody does know anything in regards to the shooting or was there on Geary Avenue that night, it would be something that if you saw it, it would really stick in your mind. It's not, you know, the average night out in Toronto when you see someone shot in the head and dying in a in a hallway. This would leave lasting effects on people. So if someone was there that night, it's been a long time. But feel free to give us a call. Let us know what you saw. The smallest detail may be able to bring us to um, arresting the person that committed this homicide. You can go through Crime Stoppers. You can call us directly. You can come through the the podcast show. Whatever whatever works for you to get us that information. That's the most important part. And on that note, it really is everyone's responsibility to keep Toronto safe. So so thank you so much for that. And thank you for joining us, Acting Detective Sergeant Steve Smith. And thank you to all of you for listening in. This is 24 Shades of Blue. Thank <laughs> you.